If you are traveling across America, you might, in the heat of the late morning, at the edge of a large city or an extensive forest, come across a large, hand-painted sign. It will only be there if you aren't in a hurry. You will only notice it if you have no place in particular you need to be. The sign features one word, and no matter your history with the type of entertainment it advertises, you will be intrigued. If you are lucky, you will continue on thinking a sign that old couldn't refer to something that still exists. Unfortunately, it still does, but only if you aren't looking for it. You are following a sign marked Zoo. Episode 2, Old Dogs and Old Wives' Tales. This is Agent Michaela Kespar, October 1st, 2018, 8.12 a.m. And I found it. I found it again. The Wheeler County Witch Hunt, case file 7-DL-1028. Date opened August 23rd, 1995. Incident date was August 21st, 1995. Location, seven miles west of Shamrock, Texas. Witness, none. Recording agent, Special Agent Oscar Thornback. Anne-Marie Delilah Hearn had been missing 57 hours by the time we arrived on scene. Texas Rangers had waited a full 48 hours to contact us, but had been on site only hours after the girl disappeared. Ranger Wilkes said that extra consideration was given due to the great heat and drought conditions. Apparently not enough consideration to call in federal agents. The girl, 8 years old, was last seen wearing a white and yellow sundress, and had disappeared from the backyard while playing in the shade of a large tree. Her mother, Ruth Hearn, was inconsolable, and only repeated, They took my baby, they took my baby. I could not, nor could Bureau Psychologist Lockwood, ever get her to say who she thought they were. It was another two hours before I was able to locate her father, Bill Hearn, who was leading search lines in the scrub. The drought situation in Wheeler County is out of control at this time of year, with most of the rivers having all but dried up and waters receding from lake and pond shores. There was little risk of the girl drowning, but increased risk of her passing out due to the supreme heat. Mr. Hearn thought that talking to me was a waste of time and thought he could be doing something more by tying himself to a dozen other people as they walked through the thorny undergrowth of dried leaves and weeds. Her older brother, Jackson, was the only family member that seemed willing to talk. He'd said she'd been in the backyard most of the morning, but when their mother went back to get her for lunch, she was simply gone. There one moment, gone the next. The gate was closed. There was simply no sign. Asking around, I got a grim impression of the area. Anne-Marie wasn't the only disappearance. Dozens of local pets had disappeared, and worse, Most had been found drugged through the undergrowth and mutilated. Since the drought had started, 18 sheep, 26 goats, 9 cats, 3 dogs, and 1 cow had been found dead, with a deep cut normally about the neck and all blood drained from the body. Ugh. The locals were less than helpful. 
the county sheriff, Dan Holden, had all but given up, saying there's no way the girl could have survived the heat for this long. Local busybody Myrtle Gander instantly blamed local teenagers for the disappearance, as well as for the death of her little dog, Muffy. The chairwoman of the local PTA, Linda Rockwell, had gathered together dozens of volunteers to comb the surrounding fields, which had more than likely contaminated any evidence the rangers hadn't found. Based on the slack-jawed befuddlement of Ranger Wilkes when I asked, they had gathered no evidence from the field before search parties had been dispatched. The amount of Chuck Norris wannabes that have joined the rangers in the last year have not made investigations easier. Blake Rockwell, Linda's 19-year-old son, had a particular interest in the case, and seemed to be following it wherever it went. He was constantly in the fields with search parties, running for food and cool drinks for officers and the rangers, and always asking questions. His first words to me were, You reckon it's one of them cult murders? I'll never forget the gleam in his eye. That kid's gonna be a monster. Wait, Blake Rockwell? I think we have an Agent B. Rockwell who specializes in missing persons cases. And I think he's from Texas. I'm gonna have to look into that later. Anyway, okay, this situation isn't exactly out of the ordinary. Suspected cult activity was wildly common to many people in the 90s. Driven on by a rise of televangelism, weekly documentaries with nothing to do but respond to sensationalism, and a memoir that came out in the 80s called Michelle Remembers. It was later discredited like almost every accusation of daycare witch covens and neighborhood pool parties becoming blood sacrifices. The satanic panic led to a lot of convictions, including one man who was convicted for murdering his own son and later was acquitted after a few years when it was discovered his son was still alive and had been living with his mother in another state the whole time. Back to the case. Further interviews turned up little. Nobody had anything bad to say about the Hearns. Her teacher, Miss Straczynski, said the little girl was lovely and all the children loved her. Their preacher, Reverend Thompson, was a kind-hearted little man with a bombastic voice that didn't know how to cope with the situation. Her pediatrician said the girl didn't have any existing conditions that may shorten her life expectancy in the heat, but that she did have some quirks about her and the heat was good for nobody. The county had some searchlights that were pulled out and the search went well past 10 p.m., but there was no trace, no drop of blood, no scrap of sundress to find her by. We had arrangements that night in a local motel, and even that close to town, the yip howling of coyotes kept me up until at least two in the morning. By my second day, I had become convinced that this was a kidnapping. Like it or not, the Rockwell boy had a point. There were enough animal mutilations to point to a dozen serial killers in puberty, and the blood draining was particularly disturbing. And it's a lot easier to kill a little girl than a full-grown cow. The entire town had been looking for her in the fields, adding another set of eyes wouldn't make a difference. I decided to leave my team with the search party and went to investigate the animals to see if I could find any evidence of either a developing serial killer or a growing satanic cult. The amount of mutilated animals had been alarming enough and the town's other crime statistics low enough that a particular goat had been delivered to the coroner's office. The coroner was too drunk to be bothered, but a local vet who had performed a necropsy was available to go over her findings with me. Dr. Blinkenship was very good at her work, meticulous and profoundly unsupportive of the idea that this was the work of teenagers or a cult. She showed me a few scratch marks around the chest and back from long claws with a strong grip. The fur of the neck was clotted and congealed in a deep and ragged knot of rusty red wool. When she pulled back the fur, there was a deep puncture, a serrated line that was slightly curved, set deep into the skin, all the way down to the bones of the neck. Dr. Blankenship noted that the cut expanded outward from two points near the center, connecting and spreading, more like a puncture from the canine teeth of a predatory animal than the long slice starting at one end a person would expect from a ritual dagger or a pocket knife. The wound, in conjunction with the scratches, make it pretty obvious. This is an animal bite. The scratches would indicate a bobcat. I returned to the location to find the townspeople had turned from a search party into a mob. 
The county sheriff, Holden, was calling his deputies off of the case. It was a little past four in the afternoon, and the sheriff was ending county involvement in the search. The girl had now been missing four days and some change in the hottest, driest weather the county had ever seen. According to every logical expectation, the girl was dead. I'd resolved myself to that only a few hours after we'd arrived. To tell you the truth, I'd kind of hoped she'd been kidnapped. It's easier to survive a kidnapping than being lost in Texas in the summer with no water. The town had turned upon the sheriff. Linda Rockwell had rallied the PTA and was now accusing Sheriff Holden of being involved in a satanic cult. Linda was going on about how prevalent they were and how she'd seen in the news there was probably one in every town these days. Ranger Wilkes was in his usual position, leaning up against a Dodge truck, slack-jawed and unimpressive. Bill Hearn was in particular very convinced by Linda's accusation. I stepped between the man with the missing daughter and the bewildered sheriff. There was an argument and I tried to ease the fears of the town. I tried to appeal to the grieving man. I told him there was no evidence of a cult, that the animals weren't sacrifices, but killed by a wild animal, probably a bobcat. He accused me of lying, of trying to cover for the sheriff. I was becoming a bit concerned about being looped into the satanic cult party when I heard Jackson Hearn yelling. He and Blake Rockwell had come across some kind of animal den. Blake had cornered some creature and the area was covered in blood. We all ran, the sheriff, Bill Hearn, Ranger Wilkes, and myself taking up the lead. When we arrived, it looked like the creature had turned the tables and had now cornered the Rockwell boy. The creature was mottled gray, almost green in color, on four legs with a long snout and a bony whip-like tail. It snarled and hissed in a blood-drenched pressed dirt warren, sidestepping collected bones and flashing teeth threateningly at Blake Rockwell. When we arrived, it turned, quickly reevaluated its chances, and decided rightly that while it may have had a chance at taking on a skinny boy in a Nirvana t-shirt, it had less chance against three grown men with guns, and one who had somehow gathered a pitchfork. It turned and bolted into the underbrush. I shouted for somebody to stop it when Ranger Wilkes pulled out, no shit, a Colt revolver, and at 20 yards, shot the fleeing creature square in the chest. It yiped and rolled into a ball as it pushed another yard into the bush and stopped. I was thoroughly impressed by Ranger Wilkes' sudden development of capability. The Rockwell boy got some basic medical attention. We loaded the body in my car to take back to Dr. Blankenship, and I collected what blood I could for the girl's pediatrician to compare with her blood type. The sheriff and the town reached a silent agreement to continue the search, now focusing on this area of the land. The next morning, both Dr. Blankenship and Dr. Pulaski had information to share. When I arrived at the morgue, the county coroner wasn't there, but there was a man who identified himself as the medical examiner. That is when I learned that the coroner was an elected position. The coroner spent most of his time in the county seat at Wheeler trying to get re-elected, while the medical examiner actually was called in to examine bodies. Dr. Juarez and Dr. Blankenship were arguing over the animal's body. Dr. Blankenship was convinced that this was a coyote with mange. The hair had all fallen out, and without the hair, the creature looked like an absolute monster. The lips receded, the skin dry and patchy, the bones rippling just below the skin, sagging from malnutrition. Dr. Juarez had a different idea. He called the creature a chupacabra. There were legends throughout Mexico and the Caribbean about such a creature, but he'd first heard the name from an investigation in Puerto Rico earlier that year. Dr. Blinkenship was very interested in the idea that there may be an as of yet undiscovered creature in the county, but this animal was not it. The creature of Dr. Juarez's legend sucked the blood from cattle and pets and was named for its tendency to attack goats in particular. Dr. Blankenship confirmed that the bite and claw impressions were not consistent with the dead goat and that the animal had normal dog organs and nothing that could process large amounts of blood like what Dr. Juarez was talking about. Dr. Pulaski, the pediatrician, met me in his office later that evening. He confirmed that none of the blood samples were Anne Marie's 
and said that he hoped they didn't find any blood from her, as it would be incredibly difficult for her to get a transfusion in the case of an emergency. He informed me that the girl had an exceedingly rare blood type, not AB negative or anything, something he called HH. He explained that a scientist in Mumbai in 1952 had discovered a blood type so rare only four people in a million fit the profile. It made her unable to receive a transfusion from anyone other than another in what he called the Bombay subgroup. As I left, Agent North contacted me on my car phone. The search line had lost it again, now blaming the Rockwell boy of worshipping Baal or some bunk. I told him to put the boy in the squad car as if he was being arrested and get him out of there before they found pitchforks and torches and went medieval. I hurried back, taking a country road rather than the highway. For once in my life, my navigation skills failed me and I ended up lost, though relatively sure I was somewhere on the backside of the Hearn's property. Night had fallen in the time it took me to make my way there, and the urgency I felt to get back before things spiraled totally out of control was paramount. In that beleaguered state, I saw, moving in the glow of the headlamps, the most startling thing. I punched the brakes, coming to a stop in a fog of dust and alarm as the creature stood up on its back legs. It was, at its peak height, maybe three feet tall. It had an oblong, sloped skull with large, reflective red eyes, the general shape and proportion of a grasshopper's. I punched the brakes, coming to a stop in a fog of dust and alarm as the creature stood on its back legs. It was at its peak height, maybe three feet tall. It had an oblong sloped skull with large reflective red eyes, the general shape and proportion of a grasshopper's. Long spines waved in the wind from its back. It had green leathery skin like a dried out whale, long legs with a high ankle like a kangaroo and most startling of all, a small, shallow mouth, similar to a human's, but when it hissed at the light from the headlamps, it exposed a pair of absolutely terrifyingly long incisors. <sighs> okay. And there, at the edge of the road, where the lamplight faded into the murky heat of a Texas night, stood a girl with filthy blonde hair and a tattered, dirty, yellow sundress. The creature jumped toward her as it landed and dug the long claws of its hands into the cracked, dry soil at the edge of the road. The girl, no more than four feet from it, looked at me, then walked over to the creature and slipped her hand into its claw. They then bolted into the dry underbrush. I sat there unbelieving. What had I just seen? A mirage? Some hallucination of the heat? Even with the air conditioner pumping at full blast, it had to be over 90 in the car. I got out, pulled my sidearm, and started digging through the brush after them. I wedged myself through a tunnel of brambles big enough for a child, tearing at my suit and skin for a good 15 minutes. When I finally found the creature's den, I was amazed. It was nestled beside a dried-out riverbed that must have normally been a draw for local wildlife, an easy hunting ground for the creature. But here, in this wasteland glen, sat only a little girl playing with the bones of dead animals. He said you'd come, she said. Who? I asked. The man in the hat. He said you'd come and take Herbert away. Who is Herbert? I asked. My friend, she said matter-of-factly. I see. Is he the friend that was in the road? I asked. Yes. The man took him home, said he had a place where he could play with new friends, she told me. Then she waved me over and showed me where, in the dirt walls of an overhang, her, or the little thing, Herbert, had drawn into the walls dozens of little creatures like him, running around, playing, and as the wall ran to the right, there were less and less until there was only one. One standing alone, one catching a goat, one catching a cow, and then, remarkably, one standing next to a little girl in what was unmistakably a sundress. 
With Anne Marie's help, we made our way back to my car through the brush and up a small side road I hadn't noticed before. We passed an old wooden sign with an insect painted at the top and the word zoo on it. Probably just some old remnant of a local business. There it is. <sighs> a minute later, we walked into the light of my car's headlamps, which had, by this time, attracted a swarm of moths and night insects. I led her around the back, clear from the bugs, opened the passenger door, and fastened her into the seat. I wanted to know who the man was, and what that thing was, and what happened to it. But I looked at her and I knew I had something more important to do. When we arrived at her home, the townspeople were chomping at the bit to get at the Rockwell boy, who was locked up in the back of the squad car with the sheriff and three FBI agents surrounding it, guns at the ready. I honked, got out of the car, and went around to the far side to unbuckle Anne Marie. As I lifted her up, the crowd grew silent for a moment, then broke out into cheers. Her brother Jackson ran over and took her from my arms. Her father came over and kissed her forehead. Her mother held her and wouldn't let her or Jackson go. I directed Agent North to drive back to the hotel with the Rockwell boy and his mother in the squad car, and to put them in a room for the night till things cooled down. Mr. Hearn came over and shook my hand and asked where I'd found her, and I told the truth. The mystery, the thing that had been killing the cattle, the goats, the pets, she'd befriended it. It kept her alive. He asked if it was the one that Ranger Wilkes had shot. And I said no, it was a different one. I didn't tell him that the first thing was a dog with mange, or that they were two different things. None of it mattered. Then he said the most amazing thing. I'm not surprised that she'd befriend something like that. She has a way of bringing out the best in people. She's a rare thing, my girl. It's in her blood. Anne-Marie Delilah Hearn was back at home, and whatever it was that she'd befriended, whatever Herbert was, I think it has a new home too. What kind of report is this? What did I just read? Who the fuck processed this without getting this guy's badge? I want to know. How are you an agent after turning this in? Another sign. Another mysterious story. Spook lights, lizard men, chupacabras. This is ridiculous. Missouri in 2015, South Carolina in 1936, California in 81, and now Texas in 95. A strange sign, mysterious events. I think I'm losing it. I'm losing it. It has to be coincidence. And every time I finally convince myself of it, I find another one. Here's another one I found this morning from... <sighs> Florida. Case number 306-HQ-13633. Reported by Agent Alexander Beckett. Incident date, October 9th, 1996 through November 20th, 1996. Recording date, November 22nd, 1996. Subject, David Montague, Mark Butler, Samuel Short, Harper Crane, Oliver Hunt. The first four subjects listed above were all found within three months of each other, all under similar circumstances, all have the same cause of death and similar demographics. Each victim had ruptured eardrums and what can only be easily referred to as significant trauma to the brain. Each deceased person in this case was also between the age of 26 and 32, Caucasian, middle class, married, and male. The Highlands County Medical Examiner in Sebring, Florida was unable to determine precisely what caused the trauma. It did not seem to come from a sharp instrument, nor was this caused by a blunt force to the side of the head or ear. None of the bodies had any significant bruising or damage to them other than the ruptured eardrums and what our own medical examiner, Kathy Burrell, described as partially liquefied brain tissue. All victims in question had been seen at one of three nearby bars the night before their bodies were discovered. Staff at those establishments were able to identify the photos of the victims and indicated that each one had left with a woman on the evening leading up to their deaths. All three bartenders, Frank Goodwin of the Bog Tavern, 
Luke Bozeman of the Indigo Lounge, and Marianne Hester of the Westgate Pub gave the same description of the woman the men left with. A young woman with fair skin, very long red hair, and a white dress. Marianne Hester stated that she had seen the woman around fairly often, but she usually just had a couple of drinks, chatted up a few men, and left alone. We left our cards with the bartenders and directed them to call us immediately if she was spotted again. On the evening of the 19th, we all got phone calls within moments of each other, stating that our suspect was in each of the three establishments at the same time. My supervisor, Special Agent Dale Mendoza, Agent Burrell, and myself all split up and went to each bar to try and catch her. Arriving at the three separate locations within five minutes of one another, we found we all seemed to be looking at the same woman previously described to us. It was agreed that we would observe them and follow the women to wherever they were going. We were definitely going to figure out what was going on here. All three women left their locations at the same time and met up in a nearby van. Special Agent Mendoza, Agent Burrell, and myself all loaded up in our rental car and followed them to the outside of town to a small cabin on the edge of a swamp. Staying a safe distance away, we observed the women get out of the car with someone else in tow who we had not seen get in. We could not see much due to the low lighting and our position, but the fourth person did appear to be male. We sat quietly and waited and watched, but nothing of note happened for some time. Around 2 a.m., the women and the man all left the house, got back in the van, and drove off. We were unable to follow due to the location of our vehicle. The morning of the 20th, the van in question was recovered with the fifth victim, Oliver Hunt, dead in the back seat. Apparent cause of death, the same as the first four. We turned the information we had at the time over to local police for further investigation and flew back to Washington that day. What the hell? Did I read that right? Where's the rest of the file? We turned the information we had at the time over to local police and for further investigation and flew back to Washington that day. <sighs> Update January 17th, 1997. At this time, neither the FBI or local police have any additional leads. This case has gone cold and will be filed as such. Attached files. Photos of the locations the bodies were discovered. Photos of the Bog Tavern, the Indigo Lounge, and the Westgate Pub. Photos of cabin and surrounding area. Airline receipts for November 19th, 1996 and November 21st, 1996. Photos of a van, a 1995 town and country. Okay. Setting aside the absolutely unbelievable identical seduction sisters, this is absolutely unbelievable. What happened here? Agent Alexander Beckett. That's... Wait, I've seen that name before. Is there a file or... No, I met him. I met him at a party, the Christmas party last year. He still works here. Yes, this is Michaela Kespar down in the cold case department. I'm currently investigating one of your old cases. Can you come to my office? I have some questions that your report kind of left unanswered. Great, thanks. Hello, Agent Kespar? Oh, it's just Michaela. Thank you for coming. I promise not to take up too much of your time. I just had a few quick questions. Of course. Uh, what can I do for you? Well, it's about um, case number 306HQ13633. 306 is serial killings, isn't it? Oh, that case, of, of course. Uh, what questions do you have about that? Well, you discovered a fifth body and all the signs to identify a serial killer or a group of them, and all you needed to make an arrest... But then you just left? You just came back to D.C. like nothing happened. Why was that? The agent in charge, Special Agent Mendoza, 
decided it was something the local police were better at handling. I looked it up. They weren't. Two more deaths over the next month. The house was empty, and when a journalist broke the case on local TV, the suspects disappeared entirely. There are at least three women with the blood of seven men on their hands. Mendoza thought wrong, then. Mendoza. Do you mean Dale Mendoza, the executive assistant director of science and technology that retired in 2014? Yes, he requested a transfer to S&T when we returned to headquarters. You know Assistant Director Mendoza? He scouted me. Brought me into Optech. I got into counter-encryption right out of Quantico because he said I'd be good at it. Mendoza always had an eye for talent. There's also this. Your dates are wrong, Special Agent Beckett. Your teammates filed their own reports. You followed the women to that house on the 19th. Mendoza called the investigation the next day. Why do your plane tickets that the agency comped you say you flew out of Tampa at 6 p.m. on the 21st? What happened on the 20th? What aren't you telling me, Alex? Look, I can tell you everything, but I guarantee you aren't going to believe me. (laughs) You would be surprised at what I can believe. Just try me. This stays between us. Yep, between me, you, and my recorder. Fine, but turn that off. Oh, don't worry about that. It's my personal recorder, just for my research. It's not going to be used for any official purpose. You want to know the truth? You turn it off. Okay. Is it off? Yeah. The last night, the 20th, we had a sting operation set up at the edge of the swamp. We heard it. In the distance, we heard someone yell for help, and and then a scream that, to this day, I, I don't have words to describe. It was anguish and rage and fear, all, all in a scream. We heard it again, and then this instant of silence, and, and then the glass shattered in the car. We all looked at each other, and we knew, and we were afraid, and we ran. We felt sick. In our heads, they were throbbing. I I could feel it in my skull like it was going to explode, and we ran. The next morning, the lead agent, who had investigated missing persons for 30 years, lied. He dropped the case. He said there was no new evidence. Said the men were being eaten by gators or something. We left. It's the only case I don't regret not solving. That sounds pretty vivid. How do you remember exactly what it sounded like? Look, in the night, when I fall asleep, in that moment, um, you know, you're... You're awake, but you're weightless. It's it's that moment before you're gone. I hear it. Every time. Every night. That... That sounds traumatic. You have no idea. So... What do... What do you think it was? The word banshee comes to mind, and that's the only thing I can say they were. I know it sounds crazy, and, and old folklore can't be real, and, and it can't be down in Florida of all places, but I have no other explanation. I'm beginning to think it's not all that crazy. I was looking through your file, and do you see this? A sign for a zoo. It wasn't really our top priority. Well, look at this. The same sign, spanning nearly a hundred years. South Carolina in the 30s, LA in the 80s, Missouri just a few years ago, and, and in Texas and here in Florida in the 90s. All identical, and all showing up around where there were 
odd occurrences. Interesting. Whatever you saw that night, whatever was going on out there, was part of something bigger. And I'm going to find out what. I'm going to uncover the truth, and I'm going to expose it. I'm going to expose it all. Michaela, will you listen to me? Please, just, just listen. I'm an honest man. I never took a bribe. Never looked the other way. I never let a criminal go free. This one case, the one time I flinched, it was my third case at the Bureau. I've lived an absolutely honest life as an agent since. It got me where I am. <laughs> a deputy assistant director in Internal Operations Division? I asked you to listen. Okay. I can tell you that I've lived as close to the straight and narrow as any agent in this building possibly can. And as that agent, I want to give you a piece of advice. Please, Michaela, let it go. Whatever the answer is, if it sounds like what I remember, it isn't worth unearthing. It isn't worth a sleepless night's. Some mysteries should just keep on being mysteries. was created by C.J. Hausch, Connie Kitts, and Cody Phillips. The voice of Michaela Kespar is Connie Kitts. The voice of Agent Beckett is Nathan Gandy. Original music by Nathan Gandy. Here's the part where we beg you for your money. Consider donating to patreon.com slash zoo podcast. We're begging you. And a big thank you to our first Spook Light sponsor, Lucille Valentine, and our first Bigfoot benefactor, Paul Matteo. Zoo Fact Rougarous are localized subspecies of lycanthrope and seem to occur mostly in the Louisiana bayou. Due to their region of origin, Rougarous tend to like spicy food. Your pepper spray will not be effective against a Rougarou. Hold on, I have to pop my Anki. Oh god, no, I'm just gonna break my foot if I keep... <laughs>